Hello my friends, welcome to Fishery. I'm Alexander Williamson and today we're talking about the phosphorus cycle. Now you may have heard of the nitrogen cycle in your aquarium, but there are many other cycles and we need to talk about phosphorus and phosphates. They are one of the most important nutrients that is in the world for all living things. Not just your aquarium, but you, the trees, all the plants, all the fungi, all the bacteria, every single living thing on this planet has phosphorus in every single cell in its body. If it weren't for phosphates and phosphorus, we wouldn't exist. It is found all over this planet. It is found at the top of Mount Everest and at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the bottom of the oceans. Yet, we cannot use it as it is found in nature, as it's found in stones and rocks, we can't use it. So how does it get from being locked away in stone to being in every cell of every living creature on the planet? Well, that is the journey that we are gonna talk about today. And if you want to know more, I have an entire hour long video coming out tomorrow about the phosphorus and phosphate cycle that you can geek out and nerd out on totally. But today, let's talk about the basics of the cycle and introduce the topic to all of you. I think you guys are gonna like this one and it's something that most of us aren't taught, but it's absolutely fascinating. So let's jump in now. All right, my friends, I thought we'd come inside and take a look at a functioning ecosystem of an aquarium where every living thing has phosphates in it as our background, because you guys know what I look like, and I'll put anything that you need to know about on the screen in the meantime. So let's go ahead and try to get through this as quickly as we can. Now, every living creature that you are looking at, all the fish, all the plants, the bacteria, whether that's nitrifying bacteria, or that's the bacteria that rips phosphorus out of stone, it all has phosphorus and phosphates in it. Every single cell has phosphates in it. And in fact, the plants need it to live. Now, you're gonna need to know a couple concepts for any of this to make sense uh, as a cycle within our aquariums. And the first is a limiting factor or the rule of limiting nutrients in plants. And that is a scientific hypothesis that states your plants have macro or large and common nutrients that they need to grow. They need potassium, they need nitrogen, they need carbon in the form of CO2, obviously they need oxygen, and they need light as well, as well as water. And if they don't have any of these things, including phosphorus as another major one, then they will not grow. And they only need to be missing one of those things in order to have a deficiency with growing. Now, algae is a plant, albeit a m different type of plant than the plants that we're looking at right now growing in the aquarium. And algae can grow even with a limiting factor at a much lower level than the plants. And this is a major problem because that means if you have an abundance of phosphates in the water, for instance, all of a sudden your algae can process all those phosphates, whereas your plants can only process as much of those phosphates as it has nitrogen, sunlight, and carbon dioxide to complete its uh, metabolism with. Now, as humans, as living organisms, we have phosphorus in every cell in our body, as I mentioned. And by volume, we are 1% made up of phosphates and phosphorus. Now, let's talk really quickly about what's the difference between phosphorus and phosphates. In nature, phosphates are locked away in living things and they cycle very readily through living things, through the organic or biological world. However, phosphorus is an element and it can be locked away in other chemical formats, but very few elements exist just on their own. Most elements want to bond with another element and become a molecule or a compound. And because of this and the 
chemical nature, the, the atomic nature of phosphorus, it wants to become a phosphate, which means it wants to bond with four oxygen molecules or four oxygen atoms, and you get PO4, and the most common form of it is PO4 with a negative ion charge of three. You know, you can get all sorts of different forms of it, and those forms are all known as phosphates. So when we say phosphates, that's what we mean. Now back to the aquarium and the cycle. So as I said, algae is able to utilize these phosphates that are found all throughout the world in stone. And this stone is at the top of mountains and at the bottom of the sea. But how does, the, how does all this phosphorus, this phosphate, get locked away in stone? Well, originally it was probably part of the elemental stones of whatever made up the planet. But since the first living creature on Earth, they have used phosphorus as their main way to store energy in a molecule known as ATP. Now, every living cell in bacteria, in complex life forms like us or those angelfish, they all use cellular forms of energy because they can't just use electricity like uh, an electronic device would. They have to store it away in potential energy within chemical reactions. And ATP has been the choice of every organism for over a billion years since the first creature evolved. And it's such a good system that nature has stuck with it to this day. So you and I have it in our cells and plants and fungi, mushrooms, everything down to little bacteria uses it and phosphorus is at the core of how it works. Now also you may have heard of something called the phospholipid layer. So anything with a cell membrane, any uh, complex celled organism, or even a plant that has a cell wall around it still has a cell membrane and in its phospholipid layer, phosphorus is utilized yet again and essential for life because it allows the cell to be flexible. It allows it to have basically gates and ion channels that allow the transfer of nutrition and nutrients into the cell, but it also allows waste out of the cell, and it also allows the cells to reform and reconfigure and grow. It allows roots to stretch out and grab new nutrients. It allows them to pull in more phosphates and nitrogen and iron and all the different little trace minerals it needs, like zinc and manganese and magnesium, and your plants could simply not grow without it. So, all this potential energy and potential amazingness is in the molecule of phosphorus. And it's found at the bottom of the sea in stones like limestone and like siltstone. Now, that is because all these living things for a billion years have been dying, whether it's algae or bacteria or plankton, all of them in their cells by weight have at least 1% phosphate by volume. And so therefore, when they die, all the organic materials that are useful, they get recycled into living cycles like the carbon cycle or the nitrogen cycle. Well, when all that's said and done, so that leaves quite a bit of a concentration of phosphates at the bottom of the ocean, and that gets locked into the form of stones, just like things get fossilized, like bones turn into fossils and get replaced, well, the phosphates in living creatures get locked up into rocks in what we call lithification. Then, over millions of years, that becomes buried at the bottom of the ocean as more things fall to the bottom of the ocean and stratification of layers uh, of sediment begin. This can happen in lakes as well, but in the ocean it can happen so much so that then the weight and pressure at the bottom of the ocean creates heat and friction and it turns them into molten layers of sediment which then form into sedimentary rocks made up of all the sediment that's fallen to the bottom of the ocean. Well through plate tectonics and the amazing uh, discovery that we've only recently understood of continental drift, uh, we've realized that plate tectonics 
allow the bottom of the ocean to become the top of Mount Everest. Over time, these plates move and shift, and they smash into each other, and they get lifted up. Well, they get lifted up onto land when they collide into one another and form mountain ranges, for instance, the Himalayas or the Andes Mountains, and those seashells and that phosphorus and that limestone that was at the bottom of the ocean floor all of a sudden is exposed at the top of Mount Everest. And over time, as these mountains are rising, water, freezing, thawing, wind, uh, debris, animals walking on it, plants growing on it, all of these things break down the stone and it starts to turn into dust and debris. And slowly, plants, fungi, and different bacteria are able to extract the phosphorus out of the stones. And through different processes that we'll explain in the longer form video, they are able to render it from a non-usable inorganic stone form into an organic form. And once it becomes in its organic form, it can get put into an ecosystem for an average of 100,000 years before it falls back into groundwater and gets washed out to sea and gets locked away at the bottom of the ocean into stone again. So it actually gets passed around through organisms like crazy. The atoms of phosphorus will get used by living organisms very frequently. As soon as one thing dies, worms or bacteria or uh, invertebrates, snails and shrimp, they will break down uh, those dead and decomposing bodies or plants and then they will put out castings and bacteria will fix that and then plants will pick that back up very quickly uh, or algae will use it if it's if it's uh, dissolved into water like in our aquariums or in our rivers and then they will use it to grow and something else will eat them and so on and so forth well then it sometimes gets washed away back out to a main river and ends up in the ocean and then goes to the deep bottom of the ocean to get locked in rocks again, which is where 90% of it remains. But 10% of it is circulating in living things as we speak. And if you want to know more about all of this, definitely check out the hour-long deep dive video on this topic. But we're going to wrap it up today and let you know that in your aquarium, that same cycle is going on. And just like nitrogen is a needed nutrient for your plants, phosphorus and phosphate is needed as well. We only need about one part per million in a freshwater aquarium. And in a high-tech aquascape tank or a tank with tons of plants, kind of like this one, you may push that all the way up to three parts per million. And in a natural system, that's rarely ever going to get higher than that. However, the foods that we feed and the fertilizers that we use since the Industrial Revolution, we figured out how to unlock phosphorus and nitrogen at levels that are far beyond anything that would naturally be found. And it's because of this that we see these big dead zones of algae blooming and the algae blooms and then it sucks up all of the oxygen in the water. The phosphorus chemically bonds with four oxygen uh, molecules and then it gets used in the in algae and in bacteria and then that becomes a dark layer that clouds out the plants and then the plants can't grow in the bottom of the river or lake and then they die and then that causes more uh more acidification in the water as well as a lack of oxygen which causes fish to die also which then causes more ammonia to be released and nitrogen to be released that was trapped in the form of living tissue as fish and you get these big eutrophication dead zones. Well, the same thing can start happening in your aquarium when you're using fertilizers and these synthetic uh consolidated forms of phosphorus and phosphates. And unfortunately, we use it as a preservative and as other manufacturing byproducts, and it's in a lot of processed foods, in meats and nuts, uh, 
Nuts like legumes have a lot of it, but dried flake food and oftentimes certain frozen food can be really high in phosphates and concentrated in levels that it wouldn't be naturally in a lake or river where we find most of our fish. So you have to manage it. And how do you manage it if you have too much? Well, you need to either do water changes where the phosphorus and phosphates have been suspended or you need to take that food out uh, and don't let it rot if the fish aren't eating it. Once they've eaten it and processed it and it becomes waste, then it will become sediment and your plants will use it. But if there's too much of it in the sediment, what you can do is you can actually go to the store and buy phosphate pads. And this will chemically bond to the phosphorus and phosphate in your aquarium. And you can then just take the pad and throw it away. Or you can trim your plants once they've locked it away and throw those away or put them somewhere else. And you remove nitrogen, phosphates, everything that was in that plant you remove when you toss it away. But just remember that your aquarium is an ecosystem and everything you put in it needs to come out of it or needs to keep cycling and being used in that ecosystem. And this today was the story of phosphates and the global cycle of phosphates as well as the cycle of phosphates in watersheds and our aquarium. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you like this type of video, this kind of medium length video, uh, let me know in the comments. And uh, if you want to become a member, you can get access to a whole bunch of extra episodes. Plus, let me keep doing the thing I love doing, which is making these episodes. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you on the next Fishery.